eco-socialism has to balance these two uh, aims, yeah? Satisfy social needs and respect the uh, environment. The aim of eco-socialism and ecological socialism is, would be an ecologically rational society founded on democratic control, social equality, and the predominance of use value. That's the basic definition by James O'Connor of eco-socialism, which I agree, but I would add two precisions, let's say. First, that these requirements presuppose implicitly public ownership of the means of production. Public ownership, which means not only state ownership, but various forms of collective ownership. Plus, democratic planning, which permits society to define <coughs> the goals of production. And I would add, uh, this ecological socialism requires a new structure of the productive forces, something we mentioned yesterday, and we, I will um, again uh, uh, develop uh, now. Now, um, the, the change uh, <coughs> As, as, as we said today, uh, eco-socialism means a radical, a total transformation of the productive apparatus and the consumption patterns, which means, among other things, first, uh, alternative energies, yeah? phasing out fossil energies, uh, coal and oil, basically and replacing them by so-called renewable energies like the wind, the water, and the sun. Now, we know already that at least in a foreseeable future, renewable energies will not be able to replace entirely uh, fossil energies. I'm leaving outside nuclear energy because, in my view, it's a, it's a false solution, an imaginary <coughs> alternative. But we can return to this in discussion. Um, so it's uh, renewable energies can, can to some extent replace the fossil en energies, but not entirely. So this means that we have also to the process of transition to eco social, ecological socialism requires a substantive reduction of the consumption of energy we have to consume quite less energies. I cannot say uh, the percentage, how much, but some substantial reduction. Uh, which means reduction of production, because energy is necessary for production, and consumption. So, uh, these radical, these profound changes, phasing out oil, coal, replacing by renewable energies, reducing consumption, reducing production, uh, etc., reducing uh, the use of energy, etc., etc. This, of course, I think, uh, will never be accomplished by uh, the capitalists. Yeah? It goes absolutely against all the interests, against the way the system functions, against the rules of uh, permanent and unlimited expansion, growth, accumulation, competition and profit who are inherent to the capitalist system. Yeah. Not to speak of the, uh, of the uh, extraordinary power of the, what I call the fossil oligarchy, I mean the people who own uh, oil, uh, coal, and the related uh, industries, which include uh, electrical facilities, auto industry, road construction, uh, trucks, etc., etc. All these together, enormous, yeah, is ruled by the Ola, uh, fossil oligarchy, which obviously is not willing to 
closed uh, oil, um, how you say, uh, wells, etc., uh, etc. Et so uh, it's not to be uh, expected from that. So there is the need of a break with the system. Uh, that's what I tried to argue uh, yesterday. Um, now, what? How, how would a different mode of production and consumption, a new society function, a new eco-socialist society function. The, the basic idea of eco-socialism, or of socialism in general, is that the main decisions about what we should produce and what we should consume cannot be taken by an elite of rulers, a small oligarchy of bank owners, uh, enterprise owners, etc nor by a political elite of bureaucrats, a politburo, a boss plan, uh, entity, etc. But has to be, which was the Soviet model, disappeared, the failed Soviet one, but has to be taken by the people themselves, the population itself, not only the workers. <coughs> the whole population has to decide what we want to produce, what we want to consume, how to do it, and which needs have to be satisfied, and how to preserve environment. This is what we call equal socialist democratic planning. Now, of course, uh, the argument against planning is to say planning failed. See what happened in the Soviet Union. Right? Uh, <coughs> in fact, I think the only answer we can give is that this was a caricature of planning, because it was a bureaucratic planning uh, which inevitably became inefficient and arbitrary, although it must be said that it was able to transform the Soviet Union from a backward semi-agrarian country in one of the most powerful industrial, industrialized countries in the world. But still, one can say that it basically it was a failure. And uh, of course, this is not the model we want to put forward or eco-socialism, because uh, the, the, the basic idea of eco-socialism is that planning has to be democratic, which means the people themselves have to decide what is to be produced and what is to be consumed, and not some elite body of technocrats or bureaucrats. Now, uh, <coughs> The idea of democratic planning is not as usually be, is present, the idea of a central planning. There is a central body which decides it's the plan, etc. No. It's the idea that the concerned population itself has to discuss and decide on the basic orientations of the plan, I mean, of what we want to produce and what we want to consume. Um, and make decisions. For instance, uh, should we work less hours and produce less commodities and products? Yeah. Or should we work more hours to have more products? Yeah. That's a decision. Yeah. And this decision is to be made by the people themselves, yeah. not by the market, yeah. which favors only those who are uh, possess, possess the, the, the money. Uh, nor by some bureaucratic uh, elite body who knows better than the people what uh, should be done, but by the people themselves, right? Um, and at all levels, yeah, at the level of one town, for instance, for the, a decision like, should we put a tax on uh, car owners to subsidize public transportation? Right? Everybody who has a car has to pay a tax and with this tax, we will develop underground transport, buses, etc., etc. Should we do this or not? Yeah? It can be decided at the level of one town. Yeah? The population of the town decides. And so on a regional um, sphere, and then on a national level, and hopefully one day on a continental level, like Europe, <coughs> or perhaps Latin America, etc. Um, 
Of course, uh, this is a process, this process of democratic plan, full of contradictions. Uh, it's not a peaceful uh, river uh, flowing. Uh, it's full of contradictions. Uh, and w it's a process where different viewpoints enter in competition and in conflict. Yeah? Some people will say, uh, we need to, uh, I don't know, um, close auto plants. Yeah? Uh, we don't need private cars anymore. We have to close all uh, plants of car production and, uh, uh, and make them produce something completely different, uh, produce, uh, let's say, uh, buses and uh, trains or bicycles, etc. Yeah? And some people will say, no, uh, private cars are still needed yeah? and uh, we have to still produce cars, etc. So there will be different viewpoints presented by uh, specialists, technicians, economists, etc. But the basic idea is that the people will decide, yeah? the basic uh, orientation. So this is not a process without conflict, without contradiction, without different viewpoints. And some people with different viewpoints may organize themselves in political parties because they agree on several issues. And this is part of the process of democratic planning, to have uh, uh, a, diver a political and cultural pluralism, yeah? different perspectives, viewpoints, propositions, which are presented, different political <coughs> organizations, and the people have to decide. Uh, <coughs> there are different ways to think about how such a democratic eco-socialist system could work. In my view, it but just as one, one opinion, my view, it should combine direct with representative democracy. Yeah? We need both. That means the basic decisions yeah, on production and consumption uh, should be made by the population, yeah, by a kind of vote, a referendum, or something. Yeah? Uh, and then it should be left for elected delegates, representatives, to work out how this should be translated into practice, yeah? the details of the execution of these decisions. And then there must be also an executive body who translates uh, this uh, orientation into practice, etc. So there is room both for direct democracy and representative. Now, um, yes. Now, the, the, one of the main difficulties is about what are social needs. Yeah, the, the aim of production is to satisfy social needs. Well, some of the needs are basic, yeah? basic needs. Some people call them biblical needs because they <laughs> appear in the Bible. Yeah? That means every human being has to drink, first thing, eat, have some sort of clothing, and some sort of roof. Yeah? So these are kind of basic biblical needs. And then you have to add, of course, needs of civilized societies like uh, culture, education, health, transport, etc. So these are the most important needs, but there are other needs. And here comes a distinction which is very crucial for e eco-socialist planning, a distinction between those needs who are real social needs and those who are the artificial needs created by capitalism. Because capitalism has created throughout its history permanent new needs, many of them which are artificially promoted by the system itself, by its ideology, and by one of its basic components, which is uh, advertising. Yeah? advertising. So uh, advertising is something very important in creating the consumerist uh, uh, behavior, yeah? which is a very important component of 
modern capitalist society. People are motivated by a kind of compulsory need for consume, uh, bigger and bigger amounts of commodities, um, many of them not very useful, but they have some sort of prestige. And um, there is a kind of excessive <coughs> need of consumption. There is also something well studied by sociologists, which is <coughs> called um, conspicuous consumption. That means you consume products not for the use value, but to show off how rich, powerful, big you are, etc., etc. Uh, Thorsten Wegler, the sociologist, wrote a very interesting book on this. Um, and then there is a thing called inbuilt obsolescence of products. That means products are manufactured so that in one or two or three years they become obsolete and they don't work anymore. You have to change it for a new one, etc. <coughs> this is part of the consumerist uh, system of bourgeois capital, modern capitalist society. And again, advertisement is a very, very important component of this consumerist obsession and behavior because we are submitted to advertisement uh, everywhere. Yeah? In our mailbox, full of advertisement. We go into the streets, posters everywhere, advertisement. We take our car, we go to the fields and full of uh, advertisement everywhere. Uh, we open our radio advertisement, the TV advertisement, we go to the movies, we have 20 minutes of advertisement. Uh, we open our newspaper, <coughs> most of the pages are full of advertisement. And this goes on from morning to the evening and from cradle to the um, burial? Grave. Grave, yeah, from cradle to the grave. Yeah? It's a permanent um, process of brainwashing, let's put it that way. Yeah? So this is uh, the promotion of artificial needs. Yeah. Now, uh, the problem is who is going to decide which needs are real ones, social needs, and which ones are artificial? Is it the Politburo? Is it the Revolutionary Party? Is it the vanguard of the work process? No. Uh, the experts. It has to be decided by people themselves. By people themselves. Now, uh, what is the hope that people themselves will uh, make the good decision? Well, one first condition, not sufficient, but absolutely <coughs> necessary, to permit people to choose the real needs and distinguish them from the official one, is the disappearance of advertisement. The appearance of advertisement, which, by the, by the way, would be a, a, a massive uh, economy in, uh, let's say, we, we, in other terms, it will put an end to a massive waste of labor, um, raw materials, paper, etc., uh, energy, yeah, a lot of electricity, uh, energy which is put into advertising, etc. Uh, so it was an important step. Suppressed advertisement will be an important step in reducing the consumption of raw materials and energy and the waste of labor time. And at the same time, the suppression of advertisement will create the conditions, not immediately, but in the process, for, of people of slowly getting rid of the imaginary fetishistic uh, <coughs> official uh, needs created by the society and choose what are the real uh, the real social needs. So if we want to reduce consumption and therefore the use of energy and uh, redu the reduction of production, uh, the suppression of advertisement would be one of the first steps in the process of transition from capitalism to a society. Because we know this will be a process, it will be, not be something which will happen like this in, in one day or one week, 
to be a historical process. And the suppression of advertisement is one of the first steps in this process. Now, uh, and of course, uh, that may people may ask the question, but which guarantee we have that people will make the correct decisions from the viewpoint of the environment? Yeah? Because, as I said, there has to be an equilibrium between satisfaction of the social needs and respect for the environment. And that's the condition to, uh, uh, let's say, uh, move towards a society where we will not be submitted to the sort of dangers of global warming, for instance, which uh, are threatening us in, in present society, in the capitalist society. So, um, so what, what is a guarantee that people will make the, the good decisions, that they really will take decisions which uh, will be able to um, prevent the global warming and uh, which will really reduce the consumption of uh, energy, etc., etc. So, of course, there, there, there is no, uh, no absolute guarantee. Huh? It's only we can say that once people are freed from the pressure of uh, commodity fetishism and the dominant ideology and uh, the advertisement, there is a real possibility of making good choices. Yeah? But somehow, uh, eco-socialism is based on what I would call a democratic wager. Yeah? I mean, a wager on the fact that people, uh, once they are freed of the pressure of the commodity fetishes and advertisement, they are able to make uh, the good decisions. They may make mistakes, there will be mistakes, certainly, but hopefully they will be corrected. And anyhow, uh, the democratic decision of the people is the best available solution, yeah? because we know the market will not do it, the capitalist owners will not do it, uh, the fossil oligarchy will not do it, uh, some body of experts certainly will do much more mistakes than the people. We have learned from the Soviet experience. So still, uh, the idea that the people themselves will decide is a more reasonable uh, alternative. Uh, and anyhow, much better than the other ones, which would be a ecological dictatorship or something like that. Uh, we, we obviously, that, that's no, no, no alternative. Now, um, also, the, this wager on the democratic rationality of the people, let's say, is based on the idea that consumerism is not something inherent to human nature, as we have heard so many times uh, in dominant ideology. People want to consume more and more, etc. Well, uh, there exist many other societies or in pre-capitalist societies or in other cultures where the impulse to consume more and more, to accumulate more and more goods is not predominant. People have other aspirations. Uh, they think other things are more important than to have more and more commodities. So it's not something inherent in uh, human nature. And one can hope that in a different society, people and he, this is something Marx wrote, I mentioned it yesterday, people will prefer being rather than having. Yeah? That means people will prefer to have more free time to do their thing, uh, be it uh, to write poetry or to make love or to play football or anything, rather than work more and more and more hours and uh, get more and more commodities. So, uh, this is a wager, again, it's a, but I think it's a reasonable uh, wager. So, um, there are some uh, currents in, in uh, progressive uh, in radical ecology, I think mainly in Europe, but maybe it exists also in the United States, have been advocating something called degrowth. 
say a capitalism is based on the idea of, of uh, infinite and permanent growth. Growth is the main value. And if the economy is not growing, uh, then all the governments are <coughs> worried and have to find ways and means to uh, grow again uh, 3% more, 5%, 15%, etc. So this is uh, central in the present uh, productivist uh, capitalist uh, societies. And in an uh, ecological society, there would be, instead of growth, the value would be degrowth. Yeah? We have to reduce yeah? instead of 10% more, 10% less yeah? for everything. Yeah? So that's an argument which uh, has some, uh, let's say, some interesting aspects in criticizing the ideology of growth, of unlimited and permanent growth, and of consumerism, which they go together. But uh, it has one uh, shortcoming, in my view, that it has a purely quantitative understanding of the problem. Yeah? That means it's a kind of inversion of the dominant ideology. Dominant ideology says we have to grow. We have to have 5% more. <coughs> and degrowth theorists say we need 5% or 10% less. I think the eco-socialist answer is not a quantitative one, but a qualitative one. That means some branches of production which exist in present societies we don't want to reduce them, we want to suppress them. Zero. Yeah? For instance, uh, we want to get rid of armament production. Yeah? It doesn't produce something useful, it's something which is not useful for humanity, so it has to be suppressed. Yeah? Uh, we think that fossil energies have to be phased out, of course. It will take years, it will be a whole process, but they have to be phase out if we want to avoid uh, ecological disaster, yeah? <coughs> etc. Other uh, forms of other branches of yeah, advertisement is another example. Yeah? We, want, we don't want to reduce advertisement. We want an emancipated society to get rid and replace it by information by consumer uh, association. For yeah? uh, but at the same time, there are some branches of production which we want to reduce but not suppress. Uh, for instance, uh, car industry. Yeah? Uh, it's, we want to reduce car circulation. We want to have much more space in our towns for <coughs> public transportation and as much as possible free public transportation as an alternative to the private car more space for uh, pedestrians, more space for bicycles, and less space for the car. But that doesn't mean that the car will disappear. Huh? It will only that place will be reduced. And this is very important, because car is not just a commodity like the others. It's a kind of uh, central commodity of for this industrial capital civilization. And it's a uh, commodity which embodies uh, the, the identity of the person. You are an important person if you have a car. If you have no car, you are nobody. You have a big car, you are a big person, etc. So uh, <coughs> in some countries, the uh, driver's license is the uh, legally recognized identity card, etc. And uh, so uh, cars have some have uh, the, the importance of the car uh, in a different society would be considerably <coughs> reduced. It would be just one among other means of transportation. So this is an example of something which has to be reduced. But there are other uh, branches of activity which don't have to be reduced, but have to be expanded. For instance, we need a renewable energies, which hardly exist now. There are solar energy, uh, wind energy is beginning. But far from developed, etc. So this has to be expanded. Yeah? And education and uh, health, we want to expand it. Public transportation, we want to expand it, etc. So we cannot speak in terms of growth and degrowth, <coughs> quantitative, but a qualitative distinction between different elements in the whole 
uh, process of production. Yeah? Of course, what I'm saying is just my own ideas of what should be produced and not, but this is uh, something which has to be decided in a process of public discussion and uh, which is inherent to what we call democratic eco-socialist planning. <coughs> okay. Now, again, uh, all this sounds very beautiful and uh, it's an interesting utopia, a real utopia, uh, I would say. But uh, how we get from here to, to there? Uh, should we wait for the revolution to do all these beautiful things? I don't think so. Uh, I like very much a Brazilian song, which my friend João probably knows, which says uh, in Portuguese, uh, Quem sabe faz a hora, não espera acontecer. Translation, uh, those who know uh, make the time and don't wait for things to happen. <laughs> so, uh, the struggle for an eco-socialist future has to start here and now, otherwise it will never happen, right? So, uh, starting from <coughs> here and now means, first, uh, to be able to bring together social and ecological struggles who too often are separated and even sometimes opposed. Yeah? Um, because only if ecological struggles have a social dimension, like only social struggles have an ecological dimension, we will really move towards this alternative society. Yeah? And let me give just one example. I, most of my examples are from Latin America because I'm familiar with Latin America. Yeah? Uh, for instance, the, the struggle to uh, defend the Amazonian forest which is a key ecological issue, not only for Latin America, but for the planet. Yeah? Because as you know, probably the uh, rainforest, the tropical forest, and particularly the Amazonian forest, are not only the, um, how you say, the, the, lungs. the lungs of the planet, but they are um, carbon sinks. Yeah? That means a, a, a significant proportion of the gases, the, the greenhouse gases, uh, dioxide, carbon, which are emitted, <coughs> uh, are absorbed by the tropical forest. Yeah? And if the forest would disappear, yeah, uh, this uh, absorption wouldn't exist anymore, and the amount of greenhouse gases in the atmosphere would increase many times. Yeah? And the process of global warming would uh, become uh, uncontrolled. So it's a key issue for uh, let not only uh, again not only Latin America for humanity to protect the Amazonian rainforest. Now uh, at the moment there is a kind of war between capital and the rainforest because the interest of capital is to cut the trees to sell the wood. It's an excellent business or just burn down the forest and replace the trees uh, by uh, cattle raising, which is more profitable, or soya planting, you know, yeah? And this is not something imaginary, it's happening every day. Yeah? Every day, thousands of acres of the rainforest go into smoke yeah? and contribute to uh, the greenhouse effect. So it, the destruction of the forest has two negative effects. One by burning the forest, many, many tons of greenhouse gases go into the atmosphere. And second, <coughs> uh, there is less absorption of carbon by uh, the forest because the forest has shrinked. Yeah? So it's, it's a decisive issue if we want to prevent uh, the ecological disaster of, of global warming. Yeah? Now, uh, the local populations who live from the forest, not by destroying, but by collecting uh, and uh, hunting, etc. Sometimes indigenous communities, uh, small peasants, etc. They want to protect the forest, and they enter in conflict with the uh, 
agribusiness, big landowners, sometimes oil companies who want to cut out the forest in order to explore the oil which is under the, the soil, etc., etc. So there is a fight going on all the time, uh, sometimes violent conflicts, sometimes uh, social conflicts around this issue in many countries, Peru, Brazil, Colombia, Venezuela, Ecuador, etc. <coughs> and uh, so this is a very important issue, and it's an issue where the people who live in the forest, they say that the forest is ours, yeah? it's, a, it's a common good. Yeah? We want to protect the forest because it's our common good. Yeah? And so there is an element, if you want, of eco-socialism, yeah? kind of common property and common administration of a uh, uh, something uh, part of the native environment, uh, the root property. And uh, there have been some advances, some defeats in this permanent struggle. And what is interesting is that in this struggle come together indigenous communities, peasant movements, ecological movements, and public opinion, which is interested in, in the issue. And for instance, at the last World Social Forum in the north of Brazil, Benin do Pará, uh, there were, were this astonishing coming together of these various movements and groups, uh, the indigenous, the peasants, the ecologists, Colleges, the leftists, etc., around one common uh, slogan, yeah, which said very simply, saying uh, deforestation zero now. Yeah? Various governments said, well, we will reduce deforestation instead of cutting down every year uh, 100,000 acres, or we are reducing to only 80,000, yeah, or something like that. And some other government would say, well, uh, now we can't do much, but in 10 years, we will do something very good for the forest, etc. So the answer of these movements was deforestation, zero, now. Yeah? So this was a very important example of coming together. Yeah? And sometimes these movements achieve victories. Yeah? This is significant, even if they are partial and limited, but they have some victories. And one of these victories that happened recently in uh, Ecuador, and I think I would like to give this example because I think it's very interesting. In Ecuador, there is a huge natural park, natural uh, resource, I don't know what you call it, yeah, a park called Yasuni, yeah? Yasuni, where live several indigenous communities near the Amazon forest, I think it's part of the Amazon forest. Now, the tragedy of these people is that under the soil there is huge amounts of oil. Yeah? And the oil companies are very keen of getting these people out from there, cutting down the trees and going and uh, look for the oil. Yeah? And the Ecuadorian government, who is a progressive government, one of the leftist governments in Latin America, uh, Rafael Correa is president, said, well, we are willing to leave the oil under the soil. But we want the rich countries to compensate for this. The rich countries, meaning Europe, uh, United States, uh, Japan, etc., they say we have to reduce emissions. And they are paying through a very complicated system of uh, stock exchange, of uh, emission rights, etc., for companies, uh, etc., to reduce their emissions by 5%, 10%, something like that. So we are proposing better than to reduce the emissions, not to burn the oil. Uh, instead of burning a little more, a little less of the oil, we say, no, we are leaving the oil under the soil, but we want compensation. And uh, some governments in Europe said, well, yeah, perhaps uh, we, we are going perhaps to give some money for compensation, and the Ecuadorian government said the, the value of this oil is something like seven billion dollars. If you, the government of the, of the rich countries, 
pay for half of it, we pay for the other half of it, and we leave the oil under under. The so that was the position of the uh, Ecuadorian government. Unfortunately, the governments of the rich countries, even those who promised that they would pay some money, they didn't. And Rafael Correa, the president of Ecuador, lost patience and said, uh, enough is enough. Since they are not paying, we are going to look for the, we are going to get the oil. Huh? We are going to give concessions to different oil companies to get the oil. And then the indigenous movement protested, the ecologists protested, the eco-socialists protested, the leftists, and there was a big movement of protest saying, don't touch the Yasuni Park. And public opinion supported, in its majority, this demand. And so Rafael Correa, who is a leftist, said, OK, so we are going to leave this. And we will hope that this government <coughs> of Europe, etc., will someday, after all, will pay for, for compensation. Yeah? So for the moment, the movement won a victory, yeah? which shows that when you have a leftist government, it's easier to win a victory, but you need to mobilize people. Yeah? Because if people didn't mobilize, they wouldn't have won. Yeah? So this is one example of some uh, victories which can be won. Yeah? And uh, of course, uh, I think such local and partial victories are important in the process towards a new society for two reasons. Yeah? One is that by reducing, by winning such partial victories, which we are winning time. Yeah? We are winning time because we are uh, <coughs> reducing the speed of the crazy suicidal train of Western capitalist civilization. Yeah? Which we spoke yesterday. So uh, if many such uh, victories like Yasuni would happen in other countries, uh, and the oil would be left under the, the soil. But that would be something towards slowing down the process of global warming. Right? Okay. So this is one reason why partial and limited uh, victories like these are important. But the other reason is that through these victories, people or, uh, learn to organize themselves, to struggle together with others, and raise, through the struggle, raise their ecological and social consciousness. And this, of course, is the key condition for social transformation. So, um, but there are not only the, the, the positive examples like this, but there are also negative examples of lost occasions. And I will give one from France, which I followed. Uh, very closely. Uh, recently, just a few months ago, the government of France, which is a very right government, by the way, introduced a reform of the railroad system, practically, substantially reducing um, commodity transport by the trains which would mean more commodity transport by the trucks. Now, commodity transport by the trucks is uh, very profitable, uh, capitalist, but it's a disaster. It's a human and an ecological one. It's a human disaster because uh, the work conditions of the truck drivers are terrible. And uh, because of these terrible work conditions, they provoke many accidents and an accident with a truck usually kills many people. Uh, so it's, it's a human disaster. And it's an ecological disaster because uh, gas emissions by trucks are among the important uh, sources of greenhouse gases in, in the world. So it's a key issue from an ecological, a social, and also from a human, and also from an ecological viewpoint, to switch the transport of goods as much as possible from the trucks to the train. And there are also some hybrid solutions, which means uh, putting the trucks in a train, and the long distance are made by the train, and then the train arrives in a town, and the trucks leave the train and go to inside the town, and so on. So, uh, now, the government, the French government said, 
uh, railway transportation is not competitive. It's not profitable enough, so we are going to reduce it. Yeah? So the railway workers protested, and they organized a strike, yeah? saying, don't touch uh, our um, commodity transport. And it would have been an opportunity for ecologists and the unions to come together with the support of the public opinion and build a big movement against this. And it didn't happen. The unions went alone in strike on the basis of their own demands, which of course had an ecological dimension, but that was not the main issue for them. The ecological movement didn't pay attention, and the public opinion didn't, wasn't aware. And the union, the uh, railway union, was defeated. So this is a negative event. Unfortunately, there are many such. Yeah? But it shows what could be done, and unfortunately, it was not done. Now, um, there, are, think there are some events which are reason for hope. For instance, we know that during the Copenhagen conference, which was a total failure, there was a big uh, demonstration of 100,000 people in the streets under the slogan, uh, change the system of climate. And we know that some governments, mainly of Latin America, were uh, supported the demonstration, particularly the Bolivian government of Evo Morales. And the Bolivian government called, uh, some months ago, a conference in Cochabamba, a town in Bolivia, of representatives of the people of the world, in fact, mainly of Latin America, indigenous community, peasant movements, unions, etc., intellectuals, uh, to uh, organize a conference of uh, protest against uh, the capitalist destruction of the environment. And this conference took place. Some 30,000 people took part in the conference, which is quite important. And out of it came a statement, strongly influenced by the culture of the indigenous movement, saying, uh, we need to defend our <coughs> mother earth. In indigenous language, the Pachamama. Yeah? Pachamama, the mother. Okay. So this is an interesting initiative, an important step of coming together of various movements um, around a common uh, demand and raising a uh, program, a yeah, common uh, 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 struggle for uh, defense of the environment against the capitalist destruction. However, I, would, I wouldn't like to end uh, this talk by a kind of uh, empty optimism. Everything is fine and is going to get better and better. Unfortunately, that's not the situation. The capitalist system and the fossil oligarchy are extremely powerful, extremely well entrenched in this country in particular. And uh, the movements for social ecological change, and eco-socialism is one of them, are still relatively small and weak. So the uh, prospects are not uh, so bright. But still, there is some uh, measure of hope. And in any case, as I said yesterday, Eco-socialism is certainly not the inevitable result of the contradictions of capitalism or of the laws of history or whatever. It's only a wager. Yeah? We can put our wager on it and hope uh, something will be. Thank you very much.